Uh, yes, let's wait a few minutes for the participants. We already okay maybe le let's start now so um, welcome everybody uh, to the november webinar of uh, the barcelona dust regional center i would like to welcome uh, today's speaker is uh, daniel tong so Danielle is Associate Professor of uh, Aerosol and Atmospheric Chemistry uh, at the George Mason University. Is a long track record uh, in uh, uh, dust uh, research, uh, but also air quality and especially the links with the uh, health. So today he will uh, give us a talk on uh, uh, dust uh, events in the US and its impact on society. So please, Danielle. You can go on. Well, thank you very much for the introduction. Um, it's my pleasure to come to uh, Barcelona uh, because I have been uh, knowing your work for a very long time. And it's uh, uh, really like a, um, a long expected um, trip for me. Uh, unfortunately, I caught a cold. Uh, so I might pause from time to time to take a short break. Uh, my apology, apologies for that in advance. Okay, so the title is to uh, try to understand the linkage between climate, dust, and uh, uh, societal vulnerability in North America. Really, is going to focus on the uh, United States in most of the parts. However, a lot of stuff we learned in the United States uh, could also be applied and probably also exist in other parts of the world. So for those of you who work on dust, uh, you might wonder why uh, the dust in the United States is such a big deal. Right, to understand the cost of that, we have to take you back a little into the history. So about a hundred, less than 100 years ago, uh, during the Great Depression in the 1930s, the US experienced a period of severe dust storms and it's collectively called the Dust Bowl. There are three reasons for that. Um, the first one is the uh, US was an, uh, and still is an immigration country. So the government only encouraged people to go west and Congress established um, this home state act basically uh, asked uh, uh, the citizens to go west and then cultivate and uh, wild land into a uh, cropland. And for 50 years, you don't have to be taxed uh, for a certain amount of acres. So that's the uh, settlement movement um, to convert the green plain into um, agriculture. And then at the same time, very powerful machineries, agricultural machineries were invented. And they can plow very deeply into the land completely destroying the native ecosystem. And also, and that was favorable dustable conditions uh, during the 1930s, and all of these working together to create this um, uh, climate uh, disaster called dustable. So how severe was uh, those um, storms? It only take a three, uh, two or three dust storms to rip off 75% of the top soil, top soils uh, over those farms. So that was a huge, um, it could take uh, millions of years to recover, right? And then also, um, the first, the, some people said half a million people, some people said 2.5 million people uh, out of their land because their land were buried, um, the crop, the farms are buried, the houses are buried by dust. And there was um, one day on the super, on the Black uh, Sunday in Washington, D.C., the dust storm from Central U.S. moved to the Eastern U.S., completely covered the sky of Washington, D.C. And that was in Congress um, during in the recess, in the session and came out of the Capitol Hill and found the sky become dark in the middle uh, at a noon time. 
So that was the time the U.S. Uh, started to set up a branch under USDA uh, called um, Natural Resources Conservation Service. That's the beginning of that agency. So the question right now is, are we going to see another dust bowl in a changing climate? Right, so there are two sides of the argument. Um, on one side, uh, people say yes, uh, because if you look at the history, uh, in the past 400 years, in the central US plan always sees a real drought about twice or once or twice every century. So the last time was 90 years ago. Are we going to see another one if history is going to repeat itself? Uh, and another side, um, uh, also the, the uh, Joseph Zoom published a paper in Nature, I think in 2011, he basically argued that because of global warming, and we are, sh are shifting the precipitation away from the subtropics, which is in the southwestern United States, and we have great evaporation because of higher temperature, we have less snow and ice cover, and we're going to have earlier spring. So all of this can amplify the effect of natural climate oscillation, eventually you know, intensify drought, uh, so much so that we're not going to have a desertification, but has a dust bodification. So that's a a term he coined in his paper. However, not everybody agreed with his name. So for example, um, Jeff Lee and Tom Gill published a paper in 2015. They argued that uh, the dust bowl was partially mimicked. Uh, hopefully we have learned the lesson we're not going to repeat that mistake again. It was under extreme economic stress in the 1930s. Now we are more resourceful. So we have more uh, means that we can handle the situation. And also we have many soil conservation measures at the place. Uh, uh, so hopefully we don't have one. So who is right? Um, the problem with that is there's no data to prove who is right or who is wrong. That was the beginning for us to start um, to build a long-term dust climatology for the United States. So we don't have a dedicated dust monitoring network. <laughs> However, we have satellite and we also have um, routine also monitoring network, uh, such as IMPROVE. IMPROVE is uh, uh, inter-agency monitoring of protected visual environment was initially set up to uh, monitor the regional heat, uh, but it also have also chemical composition and scientific information that could be used to detect the dust. So the way we did is, um, I first look at the satellite uh, observation of dust storm. This is a very clearly, um, identifiable uh, from space, uh, such as the three examples I showed on the top. And for each storm, uh, we, we located um, monitors that see the, um, that, you know, uh, inside the dust storm. And then we track the data for that time period before, during, and after the dust storm. And we find something that is very common. Um, for, for example, on a dust day, you always see a jump, a spike, of PM2, PM10 and PM2.5 concentration. <coughs> and the um, last thing about improve is um, it's also have chemical composition data. So you can look at the elements uh, such as silicon, calcium, potassium, and iron. So all of those are uh, called cross elements. Uh, it's come primarily from uh, the soil. Right? So at the same time, you see the spikes of PM10 or PM2.5 you see spikes of those elements that further confirm and those um, increase of uh, PM concentration were caused by um, uh, dust. However, not everything will increase during dust storm. One thing that will decrease is the PM 2.5 to PM 10 ratio. <laughs> because cost, dust particles are mostly caused uh, in the uh, cost mode. So if you have more dust into the air, uh, the, the ratio of PM2.5 to PM10 will decrease. And this is exactly what happened uh, for all cases like this um, shown here. So with um, such a data training algorithm, uh, we came up with five dust indicators or um, you know, index you can use to identify dust. Uh, that's including high PM10, PM2.5 concentration, low PM2.5 to PM10 ratio, those two are very commonly used. And we are also able to use a high crustal fraction, crustal element fraction, uh, such as uh, calcium, silicon. And then also no anthropogenic fraction. Uh, for anthropogenic elements, we're using copper, lead, and zinc. And last one we use is called uh, enrichment factor. So enrichment factor means how different the also is from the parent soil. 
if it's I if the, the ratio is one, that means it's identical to pine soil. It's completely come from soil. Right? If it's higher than uh, one, that means something added to it, uh, maybe anthropogenic sources. So this um is how we identify that. We run all the data sets <coughs> through cluster analysis, uh, which is a statistical method. You basically group um all the data points based on certain criteria. In this case, uh, we identify one group, which is a group of one. And you can see that they have high PM10, PM215 concentration, no ratio, and high cross elements, um, and high cross uh, cross fraction, and also no anthropogenic uh, fraction, and the enrichment factor is close to one. So this is the group um, that we identify as dust record. So where did we find a uh, dust storm in the United States? This by far is not a complete um, picture. Um, however, which is for the time period of, uh, of our study, which is from 1988 to 2011, we identified five areas uh, with dust storms. One is uh, uh, the four deserts, and that's the Moha uh, Mojave Desert in South California, the Great Basin Desert uh, in Nevada. Um, so I'm going to paint the work. Okay, so this is um, um, the Solaran Desert, Arizona, and this uh, large area is uh, Chihuahua Desert, and then also Colorado Plateau, uh, because in the springtime, they have very strong wind, and then they have a lot of uh, uh, active sources in this region. So this is on the five regions that we identify dust storms. The trend, okay, so we found um, during that time period, the dust has been increasing uh, by 12% per year during the entire period. So um, we have about uh, less than 20 dust storms per year in the 1990s on average. And in, in the 2000, we have uh, 48 dust storms on average. So that was a surprising trend uh, for us. However, I don't want to say that we are detecting the next dust bowl here because uh, first of all, the data is very, um, the, time, the, the time period is very short, that's not long enough. And then also uh, the magnitude is not uh, large enough. Uh, but this is only part of the evidence. There are multiple lines of evidence, such as uh, increased uh, rainwater calcium, um, and uh, also uh, higher deposition on slow, uh, fine soil concentration increase, and dust from agricultural expansion uh, has been showing uh, increase. Um, this, However, it's um, the, the, the trend from a few years ago. Um, right now, <coughs> we, have, we are going to work on uh, the updates of the trend. So this is also uh, a kind of surprising for us because uh, globally, uh, such as the Yaping Shell's work showed that um, the global dust trend was decreasing uh, for that time period. Okay, I know recently we have new papers coming out. So the singulars are not so clear now, but at that time, we found the US dust trend was uh, increasing 10 times faster than the global trend. So what was driving uh, the dust trend in the United States? Uh, we look at a, a bunch of uh, climate indi uh, indicators, uh, such as ENSO, uh, PDO. Uh, PDO is a Pacific uh, Decadal Oscillation. That's mostly showing uh, uh, the variation of uh, sea surface temperature over North Pacific Ocean, North uh, Atlantic Oscillation, and, and a bunch of others. We find that for both uh, high latitude, dust and a known, uh, a low latitude dust, we um, are seeing the strongest correlation with PDO. Again, PDO is the, the sea surface temperature over North Pacific Ocean. So why PDO is driving the dust um, trend over uh, United States? <laughs> so we uh, look at the difference between the first and uh, the second and the first decade of sea surface temperature over North Pacific Ocean. Uh, we find that's a clear single, uh, which is um, an increase over North Pacific Ocean and also a decrease uh, along the western coast, uh, coast of uh, in the United States. So this pattern is going to generate, uh, it's going to shift the, the wind pattern because um, it's going to bring more um, a more northerly wind to uh, the, the uh, western United States. Uh, with, uh, and then compared to the northerly wind, and the southerly wind, uh, southerly winds generally bring more moisture and um, a warmer. So as a result, uh, this area is not going to see less and less precipitation. So next, we look at the soil moisture difference uh, between the two decades. 
the red color means um, soil moisture uh, has decreased and the cold weather means uh, increased. So um, predominantly over the Western United States, uh, we are seeing a decrease in soil moisture and that means it's getting drier. Okay, um, with um, you know, the soil getting drier, you're gonna see more dust storms and also it's gonna impact the vegetation that's going to further reduce the wind, uh, change the wind partition that can be otherwise used to lift the dust from the surface. So as I mentioned earlier, right now, uh, we have um, several groups are trying to work together to come up with updated uh, dust trend uh, from multiple sources, that including improve, uh, and also uh, we're trying to Develop a new um, data set from the air quality system as EPA is a routine air quality monitor data set. And they have a way more monitors. Uh, however, they only have the total PM 2.1 and PM 10. Uh, sometimes they can have wind speed. So we are trying to come up with something on Nomad 9. And uh, uh, Corinne Arindra also uh, look at the storm events data. But this data, as I'm uh, as you probably know, as um, it's reported by citizen scientists, it's not a rigorous uh, data set you can use for uh, detecting long-term trend. However, uh, we try to uh, take advantage of that um, and to use it as a, a, a way to verify it on the other data sets. Of course, you have uh, satellite data sets. The problem with satellite data set is uh, the satellite missions are typically not known enough to detect a long-term trend. Um, so this is an issue that the community has to address. So we don't. Uh, we are not sure we're going to have a dust bowl or not. Um, so do we need to worry about it? Um, I think that even before we are reaching that uh, crazy moment, there's a lot of things we need to worry about dust storms. A unique thing about the dust uh, in the United States and also across the Pan America region is the fungus living in the soil called coccidioides. So they have two life cycles. Um, in a natural environment, uh, it will get some water and it'll grow and break down and go back to sleep. However, if the spores of the fungi, uh, fungus um, was inhaled by animals or by humans, it's got an unlimited supply of moist and nutrient, right? So it's be become a, a parasitic cycle. In this case, they will grow rapidly. Uh, within one or two weeks, um, you can convert your lungs into a big mushroom. And because the spores of the uh, fungus is very small, it can flow with blood and go to any part of your body and grow out of your body. Um, so this is pretty scary. So the question for us is, uh, because the fungus lives in soil, right? And uh, is there any correlation between dust storms and, and the fungus uh, infection? We just did a simple overlay of the Dust uh, locations, which you have seen before, the red dots, the, the larger the pie is, means there's more dust storms. And, uh, and the background color is the case of valley fever infection, um, you know, data from CD, the US CDC. We find that in the same region that, uh, that's frequently by dust storms, you have high level of um, valley fever infection. We further uh, zoom into Arizona. At that time, Arizona was in the number one endemic state. Uh, we uh, try to coordinate the dust frequency at each site to the total infection in the state. <coughs> so that, uh, that state actually most of the people live in here. Uh, this is Phoenix, uh, Maricopa County, uh, or in uh, Pima County. Here, this is Tucson. And you can see that only at uh, the sites that's closer to the city center, they have a stronger correlation with, uh, uh, between dust and the uh, very few infections. So that shows um, it's actually a local, a relatively local situation. This is the health burden of very fever across the United States. Um, so from 1998 uh, to 2011, when we uh, finished our study, uh, there was a 700% increase of uh, uh, very fever infection, predominantly from Arizona. And after 2011, uh, the case of valley fever actually dropped uh, until recently, 2015, it started to give back again. And the increase mostly caused by um, valley fever cases in California. <coughs> There's another study by uh, Morgan Gorris. Uh, she uh, basically ran a regression model trying to 
uh, try to link the very few cases to climate uh, variables such as temperature and precipitation and then uh, build up a model. And she's shown that by the end of this century, uh, if her model works, that uh, the entire Western United States will see uh, body fever uh, cases across the, uh, across, um, the Western United States. It's going to cross, um, is it going to come to the Western, uh, to the Eastern United States or not? Uh, still a question. Um, we still do not know how white the fungi uh, have spread, right? Previously, people only know that, that um, very few cases here, right? But a few years ago, there's a boy in the Washington state was uh, riding a dirt bike and he crashed into the, uh, in the surface and hurt his uh, knees, his, his knees and the wound touched the soil and he was infected. He was never crossing the county boundaries. So that was um, the case when CDC identified the uh, uh, CDC and the USGS uh, worked together, identified the cock city, all these fungus in the soil in the state of Washington. So we actually, right now, um, we do not know anything, almost uh, know nothing about the very few, how wide it's so bad. <laughs> so outside um, the United States, um, this is a study um, that we published earlier this year, uh, reproduced from Bridget Barker's pa uh, 19, uh, 2019 paper. Uh, we showed here, um, this is the, uh, the geographical um, location uh, of the um, a different variable uh, variants of uh, the coxy fun fungus. Uh, so this is uh, the Arizona uh, type, and this is the uh, Texas, uh, Mexico, and South America type, and this is a Caribbean type, uh, and this is um, the another type that's actually extended all the way to uh, to south of Canada. And uh, this is only for North and Central America, um, but we also know uh, that a very few exist in uh, South America because uh, the first patient actually uh, who died of valley fever was reported from Argentina in 1895. And that was, uh, by the way, that was uh, a, a study um, on the European Medical Journal uh, showing that valley fever cases identified in Africa, <laughs> in Africa. but um, I don't think that that case was very convincing. So, um, our team has been, uh, it's a, a large team of us. Um, myself, um, there's, there's Scott Vampire from USDA, Tom Gill uh, from um, a Texas, University of Texas, El Paso, and a few uh, colleagues from uh, USDS, uh, USDA. They have been uh, working with us um, trying to set up a small network, uh, trying to detect a, a very few fungi uh, in the dust storms. So we are using, uh, because this is not a funded project, um, we are just using whatever we can get. Um, we are building these no cost samplers. Uh, this uh, basically is a cake pan, like oh, the pan you use to bake cakes. And we put a glass of marbles inside it. And uh, you see, sometimes we put a bright glass of marbles, but most of the time we put a darker ones uh, because according to my friends, Tom Gill, the birds like a brighter marbles. So if you have a lot of bright marbles there, they're going to pick it away, pick it up, and send it to their friends as a gift. So we are mostly using the dark um, glass marble, and we also have um, this is called a big screen number eight. Um, basically, uh, if the wind comes this way, they can um, capture the dust. And um, this is the tail trying to align and the opening towards the wind. <laughs> Scott also built um, a, 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 a high volume. Um, samplers in his shop. Uh, so this one actually can suck in a lot of uh, dust, uh, but you know we are still uh, right now working on it. Uh, we also installed uh, purple air, air quality sensors. And this one is not going to tell you if the dust or not, but you can see the spikes. Uh, so hopefully it will give us the timing uh, when the dust storm pass. And after we collect the data, uh, we bring the samples back to Georgia Mason University. Um, we're working with uh, CDC, and establish uh, level analysis capability. Um, basically, the dust will be first um, grounded and extract uh, DNA. And then next, we're going to um, do DNA sequencing using uh, PCR and other methods. And this work is led by uh, Pat Ginevitz uh, and Lin Zhen uh, at Georgia Mason University. So, Valley Fever was uh, one scary situation. 
But another, uh, this is not everything. So another thing is uh, highway safety uh, in the US is actually a big deal. You can, uh, we, you can frequently see the reports on the media that a lot of people killed on dust storms. So this is a picture on the lower right uh, when I was driving uh, in the field. It was very sad to see um, the, the, the roadside memorials. However, um, how many people are killed by dust storm in the United States actually is a myth. Um, we, uh, we, we know that a, a lot of media reports showing, you know, like six people killed in one accident or one crash. But if you look at the NOAA's uh, natural hazard statistics, uh, natural hazard statistics, it frequently give you like very different numbers, like zero um, most of the years. And so on average, it's a one death per year. So I was very confused um, by this um, official uh, number. I got a, a student, <laughs> Irene Feng, who was working with me for three summers, um, we're trying to look at the different data sets. Uh, one is the NOAA's natural hazards, uh, hazard statistics. And we also look at the NOAA storm events data set. We know it's uh, incomplete, uh, but we still want to check into that. And also we pull out um, the DOT uh, fatality analysis report system. But basically, this is just a fancy name for police accident report. Uh, this is basically every time we have a fatal accident, the police will file reports. <laughs> so we were able to um, extract the data. And we found that the three data sets uh, give you very different numbers. And the natural hazard statistics um, give you way less deaths than compared to the other two. And then the police report give you the largest number. So we combine these three data sets because some of it actually duplicate and they're reporting the same thing. So we remove the duplication and uh, uh, come up with a new data set. This one is showing where those uh, fatal accidents occurred. I was very surprised when I first saw this map because uh, it's not just like your traditional wisdom you see in the dust storm in the Western United States, right? Uh, you actually see this across the country. So um, that was uh, really eye-opening even for myself. Uh, we found that uh, 48, uh, 14 to 33 deaths uh, each year. And there are two uh, hotspots. Okay, so this is a this is the state of Washington I mentioned earlier. We had a uh, we, we identified a very fever case, right? Uh, but they they are not a desert; it's an, a cropland because in the U.S. they are trying to <coughs> conserve the, uh, the cropland. So not every year the cropland will be planted. In some years the cropland just fell out, right? So it's uh, it's not planted, and those uncovered. Uh, crop and will become active dust sources. So this is, um, you, you can frequently see dust uh, emissions over this uh, region. And uh, we have another one called uh, between Phoenix and Tucson. They're within 10 miles on Highway 10. There are hundreds of uh, dust uh, storms and cause accident. Um, this is called, that is a 10 miles. And the worst case uh, is uh, between Arizona and New Mexico. This is a place called Ludersburg, Priya. We have several very large um, <coughs> accidents that occurred uh, on this place. So temporal variation of uh, dust cost uh, fatality. From year to year, we are unable to detect a long-term trend. Um, but seasonally, you have no case in the summer, and that's because there's American monsoon season. It's not surprising. And on which day you are, um, you can uh, have a higher chance of uh, dust cause uh, crash. That's a Saturday. I do not understand why Saturday uh, you see the highest number of um, accidents. But maybe more people are driving, are, are drinking and driving. And um, the hourly, uh, there's um, five p.m., which is um, easy to understand because that's the uh, the, the overlap of uh, high traffic volumes and then also. Uh, the, the, the cooling time of dust storm. In the US, uh, there's a lot of dust storm occurred a few hours before sunset. Yeah. So um, we want to compare the deaths uh, caused by dust storms and other weather uh, hazard. In most of the years, um, we find the dust causing uh, comparable life losses uh, to other weather hazards, such as a hurricane, sunstorm, and, and a fire weather. When, of course, in some years, uh, one of those um, hazards will become outstanding, right? But in most of the years, you see that uh, it's comparable. 
So when I published the paper, actually, um, that's after a long time because a lot of people are challenging this uh, result. And um, they, they especially do not understand that why we have a uh, you know, dust caused uh, fetal accident uh, in the Eastern United States. And two weeks after we, our paper published, uh, there was accident that happened on May 1st um, in, um, in Illinois. There was eight people died. Um, initially it was uh, seven people, but uh, one more person died uh, in the hospital. They have a 77, 37 injuries and 72 cars piled up. And this is uh, in, the, in the recent history, it was the deadliest the dust storm in the Eastern United States, uh, which is very surprising. So this is the deadliest dust storm in the past 30 years. Um, the number one was in California in 1991, that's from uh, agricultural field. And then we have Illinois case. Two years ago, we also have a case across the ADAS in Utah and then uh, two more other uh, Ludusburg players. So um, what you are seeing here is a very interesting pattern. The deadliest dust storms are not from desert. Okay, they are from cropland or dry lakes. It's like a very small <coughs> opportun uh, opportunistic um, sources. So it's not um, your traditional source. Um, and then all of these are from small scale events. Uh, so we, we probably will need a high resolution dust emission source uh, and, and also that's a forecast to be able to capture those, uh, that is the dust storms. So that's one slide <laughs> I use every time I give a dust talk. What do you do if you drive into a dust storm? Some of you probably are familiar with it, um, but I still want to repeat it. Um, you first thing you do is check around uh, your vehicle, the front, back, and the side if you have time. Do not panic. Can you look for a safe place to pull off the roadway? The roadway is the most dangerous place during a dust storm. Okay. You turn off all vehicle lights uh, because in the dark days, uh, people try to use tail light to follow other people. Uh, just like you drive in uh, at the light, that's what you do. So you need to turn off all vehicle lights. And for the same reason, you should take your foot off the brake your brake light will be off and you stay in the vehicle and keep CPL on and wait for the storm to pass. Um, so the Arizona Department of Transportation come up with this slogan, pull aside, stay alive, stay alive. It's very important if you are having to travel to, uh, into a dust storm. I think a lot of people died in Illinois because they do not know how to handle a dust storm. It's a very rare um, phenomena in a region and people uh, made a lot of mistakes. <laughs> so I I have time to cover body fever and uh, um, roadway safety, but there's a lot of other impact. Um, we have a team of 28 people um, from the Pan America nodes of WMO um, and from WHO Pan America Health Organization. It's not uh, as known as a, a, a few friends from Europe, uh, including from this center. We have looked into different kinds of uh, health and safety effects of dust storms. Like including uh, valley fever and animal disease. Animal, just like human, can have valley fever and other uh, health stress as well. Aviation safety um, can shut down high, um, airports, uh, roadway safety mentioned earlier, and uh, also marine navigation um, safety. And recently, uh, people are paying more attention to, uh, to, short, to renewable energy. And that's um, also a big deal because in the desert, the land is cheap and sunlight is strong. So it's an ideal place uh, to install solar farms. It can cause harmful algal blooms, uh, cause uh, water and, and food contamination. Uh, many of you remember uh, the recall uh, from the supermarkets uh, during a Saharan dust storm uh, in Europe and also uh, heavy metal contamination and radiative uh, contamination. So we come up with uh, this map for the North America, for United States, uh, each dot means uh, at least one people died uh, by car accident here. <coughs> Do we come up with an economic cost of uh, the dust impact? And uh, this is for the year of uh, 2017. The total annual cost um, amounted to $225 billion, uh, and mostly come from the healthy effect, uh, direct health impact, causing all cost um, mortality. Very fever actually is only a small portion of it so far. 
However, um, valley fever probably is underestimated, uh, underdiagnosed by a factor of 20 or 25, according to CDC. So it's not surprising by now the valley fever is only take a small share of the total cost. So we have a transportation <laughs> mitigation and also a household. This is basically is um, the cost of cleaning up dust uh, in each household after dust storm and agricultural renewable energy. Okay, um, if you compare the total cost uh, to others in 2017, uh, only in the tropical cyclone in that year uh, can, can be the dust. Uh, that's because we have uh, 17 tropical storms, uh, including some major ones like, like Hurricane Harvey, Irma, uh, Irma and uh, Maria. Those are caused uh, huge damages, like Maria, for example, killed 3,000 people. Um, th this is our exceptional year, but still, dust is compatible. So with um, so many problems, uh, what should we do? I think one important thing for us to do is to step up with early warning. Uh, that's the forecasting. Right? So this is um, and that's a lot of great work being done uh, in the United States, um, such as um, Paul Genu, you know, uh, Yosko Koch. Um, a lot of people are building that as uh, models. This is another one that uh, we are building uh, for the past 10 years. Uh, it's called a uh, Fengsa. Fengsa means a wind blowing dust in Mandarin. It's uh, uh, very similar to most of the models, uh, except uh, that um, the threshold of velocity um, was um, measured. So this is uh, using the detailed um, field measurement to measure threshold velocity. I will cover a little bit um, about that. <laughs> so we have a um, dynamic map for source area. Uh, either based on um, MODIS DOD or uh, NDVI, or you can use um, this new um, dust source map um, from the geostationary satellite. And we have soil texture, um, and we did a real analysis of structural flexion velocity. And finally, um, Barry Baker is working on albedo based uh, wind energy partition um, that's um, been making some progress. So as, as I mentioned earlier, Fengsa is uh, quite unique in that um, it is decided uh, not to use uh, physical based uh, calculation for structural velocity for each nano use type and soil type, uh, but rather using Dale Jeanette, uh, the director of measurement. He has spent decades uh, in a cropland and desert to measure the, um, the structural velocity. And um, because when he measured, he was using a field condition, right? So we need to scale it back to dry and smooth conditions. Uh, that's uh, when we did a real analysis of it, his, his data set. This method has been tested in Asia, um, and this is a paper by Dong et al, um, 2016. They showed uh, that after uh, we implemented the, uh, re, uh, the, the new threshold velocity was able to um, come much better um, as a forecast. <coughs> So I, I was looking at my slides and I found this one back to 2010 when I was still working at NOAA. Um, it's one of the uh, examples we predict a dust storm over Washington. I remember earlier I showed that dust uh, storm over Washington killed people. And actually it's, uh, it's frequently we can, you can see that, but they don't have a lot of monitors. Uh, so we, we use satellite data to do that. And the Fengsa model predicted the dust from cropland, uh, rangeland, and desert. So this is one example um, to show that so this is in the better here. And as you all know, um, being working on dust forecasting, it's actually not easy. Uh, even you have a good model, it doesn't mean you can have good result. In this case, um, we, we are looking at a dual dust storm event. That's the one here. Um, okay, so this is a dust storm. It's gonna come back. Um, you can see that uh, the model actually was um, showing some skills to capture uh, these dust storms. Right? Um, and, and you can see that the moving, the front moving here um, and come come here and you can, you can capture that. However, there's another one uh, here, model completely missed. Right? So if you look at um, uh, the look at the, uh, the satellite, uh, this is the dust mask uh, from a uh, 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 code 16. Uh, we, we, we are, uh, oh, sorry, this is not code 16, this is VIRS. Uh, this is from VIRS. Now we are seeing the, the wind direction actually moving uh, south, southwesterly. Okay, um, but 
in the model, we are seeing the wind direction moving to this way. So this is uh, obviously something wrong with the meteorology. And uh, we did confirm that with the ground uh, wind, wind direction measurements. And this is that's showing that um, you can you can use this dust plume to show in as uh, shortcomings of the weather model. So with this weather forecasting, you probably will not be able to get a perfect dust forecast. This is another work uh, done by Barry Baker. Um, he implement uh, Fonsa to low as global model. Right now, they provide uh, operational forecasting uh, globally and, and real time. And this is a simulation of the 2020 Gazina uh, dust storm. Um, so Barry basically right now is uh, at the, 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 the uh, cutting edge of developing uh, further development from <laughs> So going beyond single models, because we all know uh, that a single model can go wrong for so many reasons, uh, such as um, you know the meteorology input, the soil moisture can be wrong, a source type can be wrong, uh, even your parameterization can be wrong. So we are coming up with uh, this multimodal ensemble uh, right now over North America. And this is mostly uh, taking only the US federal agency models. Um, in, the, in the US, we have um, many models, um, such as uh, the CMAC model, high speed model, uh, uh, running over North America regionally. <laughs> now we have uh, multiple global models, uh, such as Chiefs 5 from NASA, Gibbs uh, also from NOAA, and uh, NAMS uh, from um, uh, Naval Research Laboratory. We took all the model, uh, bring all the data to George Mason University. We come up with a North America regional ensemble, and then we distribute the data uh, through NASA. This is one uh, example to show you how ensemble forecast for dust work. Uh, we are doing the same thing for wildfires, uh, but it turns out the dust is way more difficult uh, than wildfire ensemble. So this, um, this is why the reason we actually uh, only give the names, uh, the number of the name and the models, model one, model two, not uh, seen like CMAC or high split or GIOS5 because um, each model can be very wrong, right? So it's kind of um, sometimes become public embarrassment uh, for some modeling groups. Uh, so we decided to use a nominee, just to give them a number. Um, in this case, um, we are um, seeing distinctly different pattern. I don't know what the, what's the, uh, the ensemble looks like in, uh, in NAMI nodes, um, but this is what we have right now. Um, it's surprising me, uh, this is, <laughs> This ensemble, you can uh, look at the, the, the circles here, the rectangles here. The ensemble actually is showing some impressive um, skills to predict the, uh, the dual dust storms on, on this day. Um, but also um, you, you have this huge um, over prediction. Uh, this probably caused uh, by model three. Moving forward, uh, we are working with uh, WMO uh, as the sand and dust storm um, warning advisory and the uh, assessment systems uh, trying to come up with a global dust analysis ensemble. Uh, the objectives of uh, this global ensemble is that we are trying to build a global consensus of dust budget, uh, including emission, concentration, and deposition. And uh, furthermore, we want to you know, serve the community, right? develop a user-tailored uh, dust products and services. Uh, so this project actually uh, been going on for about uh, six months now. Um, we are in the first phase, <coughs> which is uh, we selected uh, four global analysis data sets uh, from NASA, UCMWF, uh, Naval Research Laboratory, and the Finnish Meteorological Institute. And the second phase, uh, we hope we're going to invite more global data sets to join as well as a regional uh, analysis, such as uh, uh, Monarch uh, from BSC. And, and the other thing that we're working on, <coughs> I have showed um, the mapping the social vulnerability uh, of dust over the United States. <coughs> but this is not a US problem, right? It's a global problem. So we have um, a map for Pan America now, and we are working uh, with um, all the partners trying to come up with a global map uh, so that you know, hopefully in the future, we'll have a global map of dust vulnerability. And we were able to update every year. <laughs> yeah, another thing is um, we are trying to um, increase the WMO forecasting capability because um, 
uh, other, other regions like uh, uh, such as uh, Europe and Asia, we have excellent forecasting capability. But uh, the, the two dots, the red dots, uh, are showing the operational centers under the WMO uh, SDS awards. The one over Asia, uh, that's in Beijing, and another one is uh, Nominos, that's in Barcelona, uh, hosted by BSC. <coughs> However, um, in, in a huge area like um, Australia, for example, uh, South America, uh, even North America, uh, even North America, we have uh, US, uh, we have operational forecast, but it's not WMO. Um, regional center, and uh, for Mexico um, in, in, and South America, we don't have any forecasting services. So right now, uh, we are working uh, with groups, especially in the operational centers, uh, trying to come up with uh, uh, to cover early warning uh, needs for regions without operational forecasts, and also uh, we're trying to come up with a global backbone as a forecast, uh, so that for regions they don't have their own data set, they can use the backbone data set. So this is the concept of how we're going to build a global operational center. There are four steps. Uh, one is that's the forecasting, and you need to provide the data such as that's the PM 2.5, that's the PM 10, deposition, et cetera. And then we need to archive the data and provide data services such as the downloading, subsetting, uh, because not everybody is going to use global data set. A reformatting uh, for health people, for example, they want to use ArcGIS format, a visualization. And also, um, we are going to work on services and applications, uh, which is something that um, WMO and the partners are working on. So we are um, right now looking for partnerships uh, to join hand to deliver dust early warning system to mitigate uh, global dust risk to the public. Yeah, I think this is uh, my last slides. Um, I, I, I think that we, uh, it's too early for us to see uh, well, you US see another dust bowl because we just don't have long enough record. But it's very important to keep monitoring on the situation. Uh, unfortunately, because the budget cut uh, in the United States or flattering of the budget, um, we are losing some long-term sites uh, from improve. <laughs> so um, that's not a good thing. And the dust even, they don't have, we don't we don't have a dust bowl yet, but it's gonna pose imminent uh, imminent uh, risk to human health, safety, and uh, economy. And we have um, early warning. Um, I think we have a need to provide early warning and outreach so that people are aware of the situation, for example, how to deal with a dust storm when you drive into the wind. So we need to uh, prepare the society for a dusty future in many parts of the world. Yeah, with that, I, I thank you all for your attention. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Daniel, for a very interesting and comprehensive uh, presentation. I would like now to open uh, the panel for questions from the audience. Yeah, I can. Yeah, you go. So, uh, yeah, there's a question here by, uh, by James, James King. Uh, so whether is WMO also thinking of supporting a measurement network to calibrate, validate these forecasting efforts? Yeah, I, I think this is, a, this is something that uh, we have been um, thinking of once we come to, uh, for now, I think we all, only have two regional, operational regional centers and they are doing a lot uh, you know, to calibrate, calibrate and validate on their own product. For the global ones, uh, right now, I don't think uh, SDF, uh, WMO is doing anything, uh, especially for dust. Um, but there are a lot of other ongoing effort for air source and air quality. I think once we move to the global reanalysis, and also the once we establish the global operational centers, uh, we we should we should, and this is definitely a must to do. Okay, another another question by by Amato. I I suggest everybody to ask some questions. Uh, so and just please use the Q and Q and A. So um, Amato is asking is if is there one major source of the spread in the mole forecasts for U.S. dust storm for the U.S. dust storms. Um, so is there one major source of the spread in the mole forecast that you showed? Uh, basically. 
it it was it was clear that there was a like a large hot spot there in those forecasts and it was like produced just by one model yeah um i i i do not remember uh, what caused that that's maybe also isobogenic sources uh, or it can be a residual from a night storm um, from the previous day so i don't think that that's, uh, that area is a uh, very active dust source region but i'm not sure uh, amanto is that your question does that answer your question yeah i think i think uh, he was asking is whether that kind of uh spread and uh, in the in the model forecast so if, if there's one major source producing that spread um so i understand uh um you know like if it, there's like a regional area where like the models let's say disagree uh, a lot and that if that is kind of i would say you know i'm, not, I'm interpreting you so if that is persistent in the forecasts uh, or it is that one event that you showed yeah, we um, I I don't think we have enough um, data set right now to come to the conclusion. Um, okay, so he said uh, sort of like yeah, if it's meteorology or the surface characterization in the models. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. So I think uh, meteorology probably is important. It, right now, we find that uh, to get a small dust storms, you will typically need to come to three kilometer resolution uh, to be able to get the wind gust. And, and we find that a 12 kilometer currently running and the national air quality forecast is not enough to capture the smaller ones. Um, but the surface obviously is the key. Uh, for example, the those uh, cropland dust is right, just because the farmers decided to tear the land when, it, when, it, uh, when the land was very dry, right? So we will need to have real time uh, a, a, a dynamic source map to be able to capture that kind of dust storms. In uh, the traditional sources are, are actually much easier to predict compared to those uh, dynamic or, or random sources. Okay. More questions? Uh, yeah, so Amato is saying thanks. Um, while there's another question, I, I would follow up on this one. Well, there's one by Sophie Bellman. Uh, do the forecasts take into account such things as snowfall and following on lake volumes? Uh, of, you know that is in in low snow years there are lower lake le lake levels and more dry lake beds. For example, uh, does this impact the probability of dust storm of dust of a dust storm storm, or are dry fields a more likely source? So yeah. basically, like she's asking if. If you're taking into account things like like snowfall, um, and you know if this is impacting currently the forecasts or not, yeah, we we do not consider uh, slow for uh, uh, directly, but however, we uh, in the model we have um, I have a, a parameter set uh, if the temperature is um, below freezing, then we do, do not emit uh, dust. So that's uh, sort of indirectly uh, consider that slow for. Um, <clears throat> For the dry, uh, the falling of the lake volume, uh, this is not considered um, because we just don't have the information. Uh, but I believe it's a very important, um, it's a very important feature of that. Um, hopefully, in the future, we will be able to use um, real-time observation, you know, such as uh, satellite data, right? Be able to do that. This, this, because those sources can be very active. So, uh, Hervé is asking, Hervé Petetan from BSC asking a few questions. So, what do we know about the spatial variability of the presence of this fungus responsible for the valley fever? Uh, and uh, if they are present both in, uh, like, like where do you likely find them more in desert or agricultural areas or other? And uh, to which extent uh, the increasing trends in body fevers or dust storms could be due to a change in the monitoring capabilities. So I will repeat the first question is the spatial variability. If we know something on the spatial variability in the soils of the of the fungus. Yeah, I mean, as I mentioned, uh, we know very little about the body fever, so that's a lot of things. Uh, the spatial very uh, very variability, I I don't think we know right now. Um, for example, in the U.S., we only do like sampling when there's um, 
that's a reported new cases, right? And then the, the map we got was from like 50 years ago uh, when, when they first did it, and it's not just a girl's, um, diagnosis of, of very, very few cases. So we have not been able to step up uh, to do a large scale. I think right now, um, Amanda probably can talk a little more about this. Uh, in the states like uh, California, Arizona, uh, they have uh, they are they, uh, the most impacted by very few. They are uh, doing a lot of work on that. But on the national scale, on the continental scale, uh, and across Pan American scale, I don't think that we have uh, you know, enough information to verify the spatial pattern. Um, and they, um, in higher quantity in desert or agriculture. <laughs> Actually, um, cropland was considered not um, so favorable for the uh, for very fever fungus, for coxie fungus, um, because they um, it, this requires certain um, moisture uh, and temperature and nutrient, right? So to grow. <laughs> and now um, people think that it's a very fever actually spread is related to the animals in the desert, uh, such as rodents, and they, they can dig into the land and then uh, animals, uh, the fungus actually feed on, on, on dead animals. Um, so they can bring the fungus to the surface. And, and so that's, um, that's probably uh, something that happened uh, in, uh, in some part of the, the country. So it's still not, not to answer the questions about that. It's in the desert or agricultural area. So to which extent an uh, increase of very uh, very fever uh, uh, that can be due to change your monitoring capability. Yeah. So before 2000, um, when that was uh, the data was typically not used because uh, there, there's an increase the uh, monitoring and diagnosis of very few cases. And after 2000, the data is uh, more or less stable. But uh, 2013, they have a large change of. Uh, 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 procedures in you know, a big lab, and that's cost. So the data actually is um, it is still um, <coughs> evolving, but and I think uh, by a large fraction. I mean, we are we only seeing the tip of the iceberg. Um, a lot of people just don't uh, don't have any symptoms, and lots of people think that's a cold, uh, the flu, uh, very similar patterns. That only like a small fraction of people uh, actually are diagnosed correctly. Okay, um, and on the dust side, uh, like, uh, are there? Do you think on the trends any artifacts or any any issues related to the monitoring data set that you are using, uh, like for the trends, or it's kind of consistent through time? Yeah, we we use in the same uh, the same monitors across the entire period. Yeah, the okay. trend is yeah, pretty stable. Uh, Amato is asking if you cal uh, how you calculated the household economic cost of dust in the U.S. In fact, indeed, I, that was was one question. It was like it's very very high uh, the 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 value that you're giving, and um, I guess that is related to like the health effect on valley fever and uh, assuming that everything is related to dust, right? Yeah, so, yeah, that's a good question. Actually. Um... Before we add a dust into it, uh, household cost was the number one cost. Um, this method was adapted from, uh, so the, we are not the first time, uh, the first group to doing uh, the economical valuation of uh, dust storms in the United States. In 1995, that's a paper published in Science um, actually did exactly the same thing. So we adopted a method from their, their study and add a uh, health impact to it and very favorable to it. Yeah. I can I can send you that uh, that paper in agreement. Okay, so um, I don't know if there are more questions, but it's uh, one minute before four, and uh, I think we need to close. Uh, I was really really great to have you, Daniel, and uh, all the attendees as well. So thanks for coming to our webinars, and also thank you, Daniel, because you're a little sick. I know that you're not having your best day. So th thanks for uh, thanks for still like keeping the the webinar and uh, well for all others like we'll see you in the next webinar that will be announced uh, soon. Thank you very much to everyone. Thank you. Thank you.